Hey, welcome back to The Health Bridge. Dr. Patrick Shojai here with Tom Blue. Uh, he has been a pioneer in the health insurance equals health sharing, medical cost sharing space. What am I talking about? You're about to find out. We all suffer in this country, especially if you're in America, with this whole health insurance debacle. And so there's a few very interesting models that are now starting to emerge. And once I got to talk to Tom about what he's doing and how they're doing it, I said, man, I need you on this show because this is actually, uh, this is revolutionary and it could change the game because uh, the game is messed up, as you know. Uh, so he is now the program director for a group called Liberty Direct and we're gonna talk about what that is and why that's important. And uh, we're gonna talk about the high cost of healthcare and how we can start to kind of navigate around that by staying healthy and then working with groups that, that reward such behavior. So Tom, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Hey, great to see you, and uh, I know you're a busy, busy uh, gentleman doing all sorts of work in this space, and um, you know, we've been hearing about each other for a while, and I finally got a chance to meet you uh, over the phone, and we got uh, into a long conversation. I was like, man, this stuff, what you're doing is incredibly, incredibly relevant and exciting for uh, kind of the, the modern day, because health insurance is a mess, isn't it? It is a complete mess. I'm, I'm, I'm couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. So what is this alternative? Like, let's just define what medical cost sharing is versus medical insurance, because insur medical insurance Im implies a very specific thing uh, in the law. And so there are other kind of, there's other nomenclature to define what we're talking about here. So let's lay that out first. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, the, the, the story behind medical cost sharing, it's in my opinion, Kind of the best kept secret in healthcare for health conscious people, uh, and and it's something I myself had not heard of prior to a couple of years ago, but it's been around for generations. And um, and and if you think the way I kind of conceive of it, uh, if, if if you think about a group like the Amish community, for generations they will uh, put money into a pot, and if you break your leg on the farm one day, the pot will pay for your medical bills. And so this is a this has become. Uh, sort of a tradition in certain generally Christian communities, and they have uh, they've been doing their own thing for for years and years. By the the 1990s, uh, a handful of organizations had kind of come come about to institutionalize this practice, and and it worked very well. So so time goes by, they're doing their own thing. 2010 rolls along, and we're all required by law to purchase health insurance with the uh, with the Affordable Care Act. And these folks raise their hand and, and get an exemption to that. And so again, 2010, not a lot of not a lot of folks thought much about this. But what's happened in the in the time since is, as we all know, who you know, those of us who are who are who have had health insurance since 2010, premiums, deductibles, everything has just gone higher and higher and higher. Networks have gotten narrower and narrower, so our choices about healthcare providers have gotten more and more restricted. And, and meanwhile, in the world of cost sharing, they've carried on without really any change in their, in their cost structure to the consumer since that time. And so every year, the delta in cost between, between managing your healthcare expenses by way of cost sharing and managing your health way expense, healthcare expenses by way of, of medical insurance has become really, really profoundly different. And so I, I was reading a book on healthcare policy uh, and the self-pay patient movement a couple of years ago came upon a chapter on this cost-sharing ministry concept and, uh, and realized that, that it represented a really interesting opportunity for uh, the health-conscious consumer segment in the U.S. So let's back up real quick and talk about why costs are going up so high in the other model um, and, you know, is there a smoking gun or is it just kind of the, the red tape and bureaucracy? Like, it seems to be, if, if one model is, is staying the same and the other one's costs are going up year after year, uh, there's either something wrong or different people in the bucket or both. Well, it's, it's, I mean, this is obviously a topic of great debate and speculation. I mean, my, my personal opinion of it is that uh, at, the mo at the macro level, until we until we kind of break with our standard of care, which which involves every year relying on more and more 
uh, sophisticated technologies to suppress our symptoms and pretend that they don't exist, as opposed to finding the underlying cause of those symptoms and, and, and dealing with them at the level of the root cause, we can, we can probably only expect to see our healthcare costs continue to escalate. So this is sort of the functional medicine side of me saying that until functional medicine is the standard of care, uh, we can only look forward to increasing costs. So sure. with that at the macro level, now if you, if you kind of drill down to the level of the individual, the, there's a certain segment of the U.S. population that uh, I think is, is particularly abused by the healthcare system, and those are health-conscious people under the age of 65, so they're not on Medicare, and who earn enough not to be, not to be eligible for any kind of government subsidy. So people paying the freight on their own insurance – while being health conscious consumers. And, and those of us who fall into that bucket wind up spending, I mean, I'm just using myself as an example, this is a couple of years ago, I was spending $767 a month on my Anthem insurance policy with a $12,000 in-network deductible, uh, an out-of-network deductible, I wanna say like $32,000, and really no chance at all, short of something really catastrophic happening, of getting any benefit whatsoever of carrying that of carrying that insurance, and had I stuck with it, I mean, I'd probably be paying close to a thousand dollars a month. And a lot of families mm -hmm. are in that same boat today. And so, what's happening is, is, is you think to yourself, okay, how is it possible that someone like like me or like you could need to spend for a healthy family nearly you know nearly a thousand bucks a month with this enormous deductible on the other end? Where's all the money go? Well, well, today the way insurance is designed, it's the health conscious consumer. That is is number one subsidizing any number of other people who who aren't paying the full freight of their of their coverage in the insurance system, and and also the health conscious consumer who is paying the freight on uh, the costs of a different segment of the population who just aren't health conscious and and are you know, are are abusing their health and 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 consuming the system's resources. Then if you overlay that with with the enormous profits, of course, that the insurance industry is able to generate. You know, you've got you've got a picture that's just very ugly for for a meaningful segment of our population. Yeah, it's tough because you know if you make all the right decisions and then you're expected to carry the burden of the people who make poor lifestyle decisions um, right. and uh, and and pay for their folly. And you know, I know a lot of people that have been frustrated about that for a while. Uh, there's another piece to that that you know I think it, uh, your average consumer doesn't know is in that. Uh, a lot of Wall Street is fueled by our premiums, and so you know what happens is you know this money goes in, and then they invest that in stocks, they invest that in all kinds of, you know, financial vehicles, and they use the money and the float to make you know billions of dollars, uh, which is really nice and convenient. But that's not why, that's not why I contracted with Blue Cross. I just wanted to make sure right. my knee got taken care of, and so that that's just kind of the the sloppy underbelly of just one other aspect of this thing. You're absolutely right. I mean, there's a very strong argument that insurance carriers really have no financial interest in lowering the cost of health care when the only way really that they can generate more revenue for themselves is to increase the cost of it or spend more money on, on what they would call medical losses. So, so yeah, it's, it's, there's definitely a, a, a glaring opportunity for a different approach to, for the health conscious segment of the population to, to manage their health care costs differently. So you're now over with Liberty Health Share or Liberty Direct. What is this? How does it work? And what's this model? And, and can everyone just join it, or is it uh, kind of an insular thing? Well, actually, this is interesting. So Liberty Health Share is is one of the companies that uh, that that formed in the in the latter part of the of the 1900s to bring order to this practice of cost sharing, and and they. Um, Liberty Direct is a product that is that is administered by Liberty HealthShare, and it's one that uh, that that I've worked on with that organization to create. So, so what what drew me to Liberty was that, um, unlike other cost sharing ministries, which are very kind of exclusively religious organizations, in 2012, Liberty made the decision. Uh, to sort of recharter itself to be open to people of all religious faiths. So the unifying beliefs that 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 bind that community together are number one, a belief in religious freedom, but but also a belief in just being a health conscious, a responsible health conscious uh, consumer. And so that's kind of the unifying thread that 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 stitches that that community of people together. And so when I understood this, and I, I you know I've I, 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 had discovered healthcare cost sharing ministries in this book I was reading. I'm, I'm looking, and I'm, I'm really at that time had been wrestling with the uh, again thinking about particularly the functional medicine community, 
But but the fact that for a lot of us, the cost of health care was was getting so great that we couldn't you know, that, that, that people don't have a lot of disposable income yet to, to invest in health itself. And so if you then if you then then look at the at the plight of the functional medicine physician or the small independent primary care doctor who's trying to manage a practice and, and help manage the health of a community of people, the narrowing of networks, the the absence of available private pay money to spend on on lifestyle medicine and treatment, uh, it, it just it represents a really ugly equation. So the Liberty folks, as it turns out, when I approach them about this, the concept that we're that we're talking about now of of developing a program that really uh, draws in the most health conscious segment of the population and and as well as the most innovative physician community to manage particularly the primary care needs of that health conscious consumer base uh, really resonated with them and and so we we devised a product uh, that sort of sits on their administrative framework and their ex- their ACA exemption that uh, that that accomplishes a couple of things. Number one, it 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 creates pretty profound savings for the for the participants in it, uh, which can then be used to actually invest in health. But the second thing was is is the product actually is designed to wrap around what's called a direct primary care practice. So this is kind of that growing universe of primary care doctors who are providing their services on a subscription basis, um, like you join their practice, like you might join a health club, and you see more and more functional and integrative medicine doctors moving in this direction because it's a nice private pay vehicle uh, to, to sustain their practice and a, and a, a defined community of, of patients uh, without having the practice balloon and get out of control size-wise. And, and of course, the private pay component allows them to sustain the practice in, in, in ways that are almost impossible given what, what insurance does and doesn't value in the way of this more modern type of primary care. So anyway, the idea of building this product to wrap around and, and subsidize the cost of membership fees to these practices was something that really resonated with the Liberty folks. The idea of using, it's interesting, they come from Mennonite, a Mennonite heritage, and, uh, and the idea of using nutrition as medicine as opposed to dependence on pharmaceuticals. I mean, the, just the values alignment between liberty and the, and the functional and integrative medicine movement was really striking. Mm. And, uh, and very quickly, that they, uh, they agreed to allow us to create this product and enlist a, you know, a, a, what is now a, very, a large and growing number of, of practitioners to, you know, to, sort of, to sort of form this, this premier primary care provider network was, uh, was something that they just intuitively grasped. And it's really been, you know, been going quite well ever since last fall when we kicked it off. So there's a couple of things you mentioned. One is, you know, you're paying 700 and change a month for the health insurance, but you mentioned a $12,000 deductible. And so that's effectively an extra $1,000 a month, you know, if you if you were to take that and reabsorb that back into what your monthly out-of-pocket would be, you're closer to $1,700 a month in actual out-of-pocket costs before anyone paid anything on your Anthem policy. So that's right. Typical uh, individual, typical family of four, what are we looking at in terms of cost savings? And then what are we looking at in terms of benefits? It's like, hey, if I get hit by a bus, I got to know that this thing's going to cover me. Right. So this is the thing. So I, I moved from my seven sixty seven a month and $12,000 in-network deductible to four forty nine a month uh, and, and $1,500 of, of expenses that I would be responsible for. In healthcare sharing parlance, that's called an annual unshared amount. And it's as simple as that. There is no in-network, out-of-network consideration. So, you know, in, in the world of cost sharing, again, one of the cultural facets of that of that movement, which I really appreciate, is is a respect for the individual and that individual's doctor making their healthcare decisions. So, in in healthcare cost sharing, if if you get uh, some dreaded disease and you have to leave town to go to a different a different healthcare facility to find treatment. That's a decision that, that you and your doctor make, and they and they don't. There's no financial barriers in the way of you in the way of you doing that. So the way it then works in terms of in terms of what you know, sort of the, the the catastrophic level of coverage, you are uh, medical expenses are shareable up to a million dollars per incident or per diagnosis with uh, with no lifetime limit. And so these are things actually imposed by law in in in, in exchange for this ACA exemption. Um, cost sharing programs have to have a few things in common. Number one is 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 the uh, inability to kick members out for getting too sick. Um, the second is is they're all nonprofit, but they're five hundred one c three nonprofits, and so and so as a result, uh, they they behave very differently 
uh, as a payer than, than does an insurance company. Most notably, uh, to, to the point that you made earlier, they don't ever take possession of, of the consumer's money and then go out and invest it. It, uh, you know, they have no, that it's not a part of the, of the revenue generating uh, foundations of cost sharing. And so they are very, they have very nice relationships with, with healthcare facilities and with physicians. They don't have anyone there whose job is to impose friction on the payment process. And, and it, and it's just, it's one of these things that's so refreshingly both transparent and simple to understand that it does kind of call you to wonder how in the world we've gotten in, you know, so entangled in such a complex world of healthcare insurance. Yeah. Well, and we all just kind of stumbled, uh, you know, up to that cliff and then fell off of it. <laughs> and uh, we just figured that's just the way it is. And, you know, all the healthy people I know are absolutely up in arms about this because, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not a, a user of healthcare for the most part, right? I'll go in for some routine physical or something, but I'm not in there all the time, right? Whereas someone who has uncontrolled diabetes um, is in the ER, you know, once a month or something, and that's what we're paying for um, and, and, and a lot more. So, uh, co-pays, any of that other kind of weird stuff? I mean, there's so much language that's layered around insurance now that we've all kind of been subjected to. Yeah, it's, it is as simple as you, you, uh, you, you pay all of your medical expenses until you've hit your, your annual unshared amount. So for an individual, that's $500. For a couple, it's 1000 For a family, it's $1,500. After which, all of your eligible medical expenses are shareable. Things that it's easier to describe what isn't a shareable expense than what is. So things that are not shareable, as you might imagine, uh, abortions for for medic you know, that aren't medically necessary. Uh, they don't have a mental health coverage. They uh, they don't they don't reimburse for um, they don't they don't cover a, uh, what am I trying to drug rehab would be an example. But but uh, but the things that tend to scare people you know catastrophic health incidents medical evacuate, moving you in, an, in a medevac, some of those things that just are astoundingly expensive are all, they're all, you know, perfectly shareable expenses. And as I said, up to a, up to a million dollars per, per incident. So you come with an insurance card, you hand it to your doctor, they verify just like anything else. And what if you're, because there's no in network of, or out of network. So they just say, hey, cool, we'll accept this or give us your cash rate. And then you could super bill. That's exactly right. So, so the, the, the scenario is, from the consumer perspective, it's actually a very familiar experience. You do have a card in your wallet. On the back of that card is how that, that provider can submit a claim to, to Liberty. And one of two things will happen. Either you'll present your card and they'll say, oh, okay, great, we'll submit our claim. And that happens, that happens in the majority of cases as cost-sharing programs have become fairly well-reputed as, as, as easy payers to work with and they're, and they're familiar as more and more people are kind of moving into these models. Uh, alternatively, if the if the practice doesn't want to submit that bill to directly to Liberty, then just as you said, the consumer can just pay cash, and you get a statement and submit it for reimbursement directly uh, yourself. Yeah, what's funny is most practitioners that I know actually have a cash discount, so it actually ends up costing the system even less if you do it that way and float the money for a month, because um, you know the. <laughs> I gotta say, I, there's these atrocious stories where we used to deal with these labs um, all the time, and so oh. we, you know, I'd say, okay, here, here's the stuff I need you to get, right? And I, and my uncle doesn't own the lab, like I just need to, I just need the data, right? Like I just need to know what's going on with you. So you can submit your insurance card. But let me tell you that sometimes the non-covered amount and the copay and all the other crap that you're going to get billed for is about three times as much as the cash discount rate that you could pay up front. So, yeah. you know, I don't know how to advise you, but maybe you want to, uh, maybe you want to just uh, pay cash, <laughs> right? And then, and then do, yeah. do that. You are exact. Labs are probably the most screaming example of, of where just paying cash is so much better than exposing yourself to whatever the bill's going to be. That's it. So one of the things that people in my world want to know is, hey, will this pay for my functional medicine stuff? You know, I go to a, I go to a doctor who wants to look at saliva and X, Y, and Z and all sorts of things that are, you know, medically necessary to someone who's actually read up and understands functional medicine and isn't just your kind of run-of-the-mill Main Street, uh, you know, GP phar pharma hawk, right? So will right. this pay for the type of doctors I want to see and are there any exclusions? Because that, that's been a big problem with me. It's like, hey, I want to go see an acupuncturist and I'm paying you X amount of dollars a month and you won't even let me see the kind of doctors I want to see. How fair is that? That was actually one of my main motivations in, in starting to work on this is that 
in addition to all the other limitations imposed on consumers by health insurance plans, uh, just as you said, your ability to your ability to engage in a more enlightened model for managing your own health was was really re- constrained by by the the fact that that these types of practitioners aren't really valued in the insurance system. So yeah, the wonderful thing is is that uh, is that is that Liberty takes a much more uh, I guess open position around around how people want to manage their own health. So as long as you're is what you're is what you're you know, being recommended being recommended by a legitimate trained trained practitioner. Uh, you know they uh, they have very very open policies. Use of naturopaths in states where those where naturopaths are licensed as primary care doctors, no problem. Um, it's um, yeah, that's probably one of the one of the more exciting aspects of the way of the way the Liberty kind of value system works. Yeah, great. That's that's a big deal to most people I know who are already healthy. So here's the other question. So if this is for cost sharing on people who are on the side of health already and are healthier. Uh, where do you draw the line? Like, uh, you know, at what point are you not eligible for a program like this? And uh, you know, because obviously, if you're kind of saddled with a lot of kind of healthcare costs going in, you kind of ruin it for everyone else. Well, that's a great question, and actually, probably the most common question that uh, that that we get about this program is is it sounds kind of too good to be true. And and there is some very real reasons why why it's actually not too good to be true, and you're touching on one of them right now. Um, you know, reason number one is is that as I mentioned, by law, Liberty's a 501c3 nonprofit, so no one there's making tens of millions of dollars a year uh, as compensation. They're not investing the money. It's you know, the, the model's different, and so it's 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 naturally more elegant and lean uh, from an administrative perspective. But the second thing. That's really a very powerful advantage. Again, because they're they're not insurance, they're not governed by the same rules of insurance. They don't have to accept everybody. So about three percent of applicants are declined because of a a pre-existing burden of disease that's just too much to to take into the to take on by the community. And so it's again, it's only three percent, but it's it's if you've ever looked, as I'm sure you have it. You know, employer health plans. It's a very small percentage, typically, of a population that that imposes an enormous cost burden, and so that saves the that saves the program a good bit of money. They have another about twelve percent of 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 their of their members participate on on a somewhat conditional basis. So about five percent have what they call a pre existing condition. So let's say you uh, had melanoma last year. They have a, they they would accept you as a member, but they would say okay. This year we're not covering melanoma-related costs. Next year we will share up to twenty-five thousand dollars. Then the following year up to fifty. The fourth year you're you're you know a full member sharing in all costs. So they they stair step into certain pre-existing conditions, and then they have a program. This was actually something that that really struck me when I was doing my research on Liberty that I really really liked. Is let's say you have uh, out of control diabetes. They'll actually accept you as a member, and they put you in what they call a health track program. So you would, and, and as such, you would pay an extra eighty dollars a month to be to be a Liberty member. They take that eighty dollars a month and then invest it in a health coach for you, and you work with that coach until you achieve the the, the health targets that you're looking to achieve, and then you're instated as essentially a full member. You no longer pay the eighty dollars a month. So it's uh, so so together, that's about seven percent of their member base. So as you can hear. There, there are some special conditions to a, you know, to a small segment of the population, but it's not overly exclusionary. And, um, and, and I'll tell you another thing that's really fascinating about this, this health track program is I've spent some time talking to the, to the telephonic health coaching company that, that actually manages this. The graduation rate of people in the health track program into fully instated members, people who get their modifiable health risk under control and move forward as a, as a healthier person – is surprisingly high, and as compared to say employer-sponsored programs, and the the thinking behind it is is that there's something about being a part of there's an accountability that kind of comes with being a part of a community of people that are sharing medical expenses that you don't that you don't have as a as a sort of a cultural element in the insurance world, and uh, and it's really it's kind of it's one of the things I've become really really very enamored with sort of at a philosophical level about this whole concept of cost sharing is is that it. It breeds a sense of, of, of accountability and, and sort of mutual responsibility to one another for for not being a, a healthcare burden uh, if we possibly can. 
That's fascinating. Because, yeah, you could stick it to the big bad insurance company, but not, not the people in your collective. Yeah, it, it gives you stewardship, uh, and, and it really, right. yeah, it, it allows you to be part of something. Uh, this, uh, there, there's so many elements to this that are fascinating. Um, you know, first of all, I thought that number of kind of excluded people would be much higher because you walk out in the street and, you know, so many people are, are, are seemingly sick and obese and all the problems that we have in our culture. So it's nice to hear that uh, that number, the, the kind of hard line is 3%. Uh, and then the model that you're talking about with people in this health coaching track, I mean, that's fascinating to me. It's, um, you're getting better compliance and you're getting better, um, statistically, you're getting uh, kind of better results uh, in this program than a lot of the programs out there, uh, arguably most. I mean, there's very few programs that do that well, so I'm, I, I want to look into that a little further. That, that to me is something that can be really unpacked. We have you know, almost 2,300 corporations that we support with corporate wellness, and that's actually really welcome news because you're always looking for some edge. Um, but I think, to your point, there is that psychological ownership and, and belonging in a community that maybe is what's missing uh, in that kind of patron, from the patronage model of like big brother company, somebody paying my bills and I can just, they, you know, they owe it to me, I'm just gonna keep, you know, sticking it to them type of thing. Right, absolutely, yeah, I mean most of us, myself included, you know, have, have cultivated a real hostile feeling towards the insurance company. I mean, let me tell you, if I hit my deductible, I don't care what the lab costs. I mean, it's just, mm. you just, you feel so so resentful of the enormous amount of money that, that's sucked out of our wallets every month that, that you're not participating as a steward of the, you know, of the healthcare system in any way uh, in, the, in the conventional model. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that to me is um, the voice of a frustration that we all harbor. Right, it's it's not it's not pretty. Uh, just to kind of lay the, the the groundwork here, how long has this been in business? Is it in fifty states? Like how many members? Like how is it? I just want to make sure it's not like fly by night sure. in that way, right? Well, in order to create one of these that that has this exemption, the uh, the organization had to be doing this prior to nineteen ninety nine. So you can't go and start one of these things up from from scratch today. And so uh, so all of the healthcare healthcare cost sharing programs are are very well tenured. Uh, those that have the the ACA exemption, um, the um, so anyway, so the the, the I want to say Liberty's been work been in, in, in existence since the late eighties. Um, amazingly, they uh, they have they have never failed to pay a shareable expense. It's um, it's a very it's a it's a surprisingly stable stable situation in that while their cost structure hasn't changed in the last five years. The, the, we, the, the ability to change it on a moment's notice does exist. So sometimes I get the question, oh, you know, what if uh, you know, a bunch of Liberty people are all out on a bus trip somewhere and, and you know, the bus crashes, everyone has these catastrophic in injuries, you know, then what happens? Well, you know, if, if Liberty for some reason wasn't able to meet the, you know, meet the needs of the, of the community in any given month, they have the ability either as a one-time thing or, or, or to simply change the, the amount, you know, the, 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 the monthly share amount that people pay. It's uh, it's really interesting to to talk to them because in their minds, you know, the idea that they they really abhor the idea of having to change that monthly amount. And I've, I'm thinking to myself, I'm accustomed to my monthly premium amount changing about 25 percent a year to the you know to the yeah. north every single year. But for in in their world, uh, you know, the idea of changing that amount is a really big deal, and they and they just they just haven't had to in the last five years, which which to me also sort of speaks to the sustainability of of what it is that they're doing. I mean, clearly, if, if they were having you know, financial issues, that would be a much more volatile, volatile number. Yeah, very much so. Uh, and, and that number staying the same also means that you know the the people still are respecting it. Like I, I'm not going to go see my functional medicine doc and rack up a bill just because uh, Liberty's paying for it now. I feel like I would be a part of the community, and it's on me to. You know, it's like the old thing. It's like, oh, well, it's, it's just a rental car. Let's just smash it up. It's like no, because then the cost of all rental cars go up, and that's not good for society. So that 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 kind of way of thinking um, is is primitive, and I think that you know belonging to something can really change that. Um, yep, I agree. Is it deployed in 50 states? Is it all over? It is in, it's in all 50 states except right now Pennsylvania. They're not, uh, they're not enrolling, enrolling new members in Pennsylvania for a reason that has to do, it's a technologically related reason that, that has to do with their, the state insurance regulators. And uh, I would imagine that that'll be resolved sometime fairly shortly. But, but otherwise, yeah, the, the, the costs are the same in all 50 states, which is sort of interesting. And and I, I've talked to a number of people, like from you know from you know, New York, that are accustomed to everything costing more there, and they're kind of 
perplexed as to how the costs could be the same. But yeah, the costs are uniform. And just to lay them out, we've talked about the family costs. Individuals over 30 cost $199 a month as their monthly share amount. Uh, with a five hundred dollar annual unshared, families are are two ninety nine, and then and then four forty nine, or couples are two ninety nine, then families are four forty nine. Um, so it's it's I mean depending on where you are in that in that in that scheme of things, you can kind of calculate in your head what that would represent as as savings. But for most people, that's that that represents a, a dramatic savings. Absolutely. Can I get this for my employees? Like as an employer, can you actually use this for your company policy? Well, that's a great question. The uh, the answer is that the ACA exemption uh, exists and applies to the to, to individuals. From an employer perspective, if you employ more than fifty employees and you terminate your health plan, uh, the existence of medical cost sharing doesn't doesn't exempt that company from from pay, from the consequences of terminating a health plan. If you're an employer with under fifty employees, however, uh, the idea of of terminating the health plan making a fixed contribution to the employee um, in the form of just increasing their pay and then making them aware of, of Liberty Direct as, a, as, an, as an option. You can't, you can't force the employee to use that pay bonus as a, uh, you know, for, for, medical, for health care coverage, but, uh, but making them aware. It strikes me for, for companies under 50 as a very, very smart strategy for containing health care costs. In fact, almost all of the of the practices that have become involved as direct primary care practices have have switched their own health plans to the extent that they've had them uh, to that to that model, and it's and it's a it's a dramatic savings. Love it. Uh, hospitals, um, hospital chains, do they accept this? Is that, I mean, that's where the healthcare costs really skyrockets, right? Is exactly. Yeah. The, again, there's there, the concept of a network doesn't exist, and so whatever hospital you you choose to go to, um, yeah, the the you know, it's, it's, none are frowned upon. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, again, that's, that's one of the things I, particularly today, I mean, it, until the last few years, you just hadn't, hadn't felt the burden of, of these narrowing networks of choices. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's anywhere, you know, even, even outside your own state, if you had to go to the Mayo Clinic for something or whatever, that would be, uh, considered a shareable expense. Love it, love it. Uh, this is a technical question, but it's just kind of r what runs in my head. Is there like an umbrella kind of um, overarching policy? Like a lot of people will get underwritten by Lloyd's or something for like losses beyond X amount, just to like kind of have a stopgap in their in their risk. Is there anything like that that this industry takes on? To my knowledge, there's not an insurance. Uh, there's not an insurance comp like a stop loss component to what it is that uh, to how these how these programs work. Um, so I, 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 I'm going to say with 90% certainty that the answer to that is no. Okay, great. So let's get into the philosophy of this a little bit because the implications of what we're talking about here are enormous, right? It's we are breaking the mold and the model of kind of this this mobster, gangster version of insurance, which is the middleman kind of comes in and gets his type of thing. And, and we've all been kind of subjected to it for some time, right? And so what the implications of this are for you know, insurance in general in America um, are, are enormous. And I'd love to just hear your perspective on where you think this is going. Well, I tell you, there have been in the last month or so, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, U.S. News and World Report have all written written stories about medical cost sharing and how people are beginning to move in, in larger and larger numbers in that direction, particularly the healthier people. Um, it's it is a little bit of a it's it's a it's a it's an interesting thing to kind of think about as time rolls on and as this trend continues, because of course what that means is is that the the good risk in the world of insurance, uh, is is seeking out this this you know alternative way of, of kind of freeing themselves from the cost of healthcare, and leaving behind the bad risk, and so it it really does. I'm I'm sure I've I've actually kind of gotten the sense a couple of these stories have taken on the flavor of certain states really being concerned with the fact that oh my gosh you know we're you know, our, our our exchange plans are going to be stuck with the bad risk while all the good risk goes over here and saves yep. a fortune uh, in medical cost sharing programs. Uh, now, grant you, in, the, in, in all of the U.S., the numbers that I keep reading and, and uh, published are about 500,000 people are in cost sharing. I mean, it's not millions and millions of people yet. Um, so it's, it's very early days in the grand scheme of things for this. But it, it does sort of beg the question as to, as to what, you know, what happens over time when, 
you know, when we when we sort of separate the good and the bad risk. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. Now, what's interesting is, is that that uh, and I've talked to the folks at Liberty about this as well. I mean, this cost sharing exemption exists by way of by virtue of a religious exemption, uh, which in the history of the country, apparently these you know, these have not been overturned and it would take an act of Congress to, you know, to get rid of the religious exemption. And um, and interestingly enough, it was it was one that was actually originally created by by Democrats as part of the ACA legislation and, and of course, would presumably be supported by Republicans. So it's it's not something that seems to be in in particular kind of political peril. Uh, and, and of course, if you think about it, I mean, how in the world do you justify uh, overturning something like this so that health conscious people can spend out the nose for people, you know, for, for everybody else who's not health conscious? I mean, just the, 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 the messaging of that doesn't sound very good. So it's uh, it's not something that uh, the Liberty folks lose a lot of sleep about. Yeah, although, you know, what's funny is I distinctly recall being offended when listening to Obama talking about how he was pitching uh, the Affordable Health Care Act. And, you know, they, they, they kept saying, hey, well, look, don't worry about it because we're going to bring so many more healthy people into the fold that it's going to, you know, balance it out for your for the insurance companies because they were so afraid of of the risk pools and all that, that Obama was guaranteeing to like, you know, deliver these sacrificial lambs and all these healthy people who, you know, end up paying for health care and, and kind of evening out that, that, that cost. So uh, right. I, I think that this conversation will be had again. And I think this is a conversation for society because really, you know, look, there's a the person that's born with a congenital disease and I feel like we need to take care of everybody, and we are our brother's keeper. And you know, people have diagnosable illnesses that that uh, we should support. But for me, if someone is just killing themselves with Doritos and and terrible food decisions, and 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 really just kind of making it uh, you know a lifestyle issue and taking on a lot of bad decisions, I don't feel like I want to pay for that, right? And I, and I know a lot of people feel the same way. So this is going to open up a very interesting, significant debate about what philanthropy and what healthcare and what, you know, kind of our social services is going to be about in the ensuing decades as healthy people start opting out of the, 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 the sick care system and moving over to stuff like this more often, in my opinion. I think you're exactly right. It's going to be fascinating to watch as the numbers continue to grow and and sort of see where it, see where it goes. Yeah. Well, listen, I love what you're doing. I, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm fascinated by this topic. I think it's uh, uh, one of the solutions uh, that needs to be there. There's obviously you know self care. There's lifestyle. There's good functional medicine. There's all sorts of pieces to this puzzle. But who pays the health care bill is the healthcare debate right now. And, you know, the healthcare debate should be, you know, how should I live and how should I stay healthy? But, you know, this whole, like, who pays the bill financing piece has really crowded out the conversation. And I think that this brings some of the noise in that channel down. So I really appreciate where you're coming from with this. Well, thank you. Yeah. So uh, I know we, you gave me a link and we made a, a smart link for this. It's well.org slash liberty. Uh, where um, I know people are going to have a lot of questions about this, so we're just going to like have a have that link go straight over to uh, all the information about this because I've been poking around and researching. Uh, what I ask our readers, our listeners, and our viewers to do is really just look into all of it and really kind of compare it out and, and do it. Um, I'm moving over with my family. I think I'm going to bring my whole company over on this. Um, I've done my due diligence, but I ask you to do yours type of thing. Uh, but check it out. We're going to we're going to have a link at well.org.liberty so that you can see for yourself if it's for you. I highly recommend looking into it. Uh, Tom, uh, I'm really, really impressed with what you guys have been able to put together. I think that um, it's a bold move in, in the climate that we live in and someone had to do it and um, I salute you for doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on the on the show. I'm so glad to have finally uh, gotten to do this with you in person. Yeah, this is great. This is great. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Tom Blue, check us out at uh, well.org slash liberty. I'll put a link over to all their stuff. And uh, from there, let's hear about what's been bothering you with healthcare, just wherever you've seen this, go ahead and give us comments. We're gonna figure out how to keep this conversation going. Let's come up with solutions. Let's be healthy together. I'll see you next week.